what um, I'm going to do is on a piece of paper, I'm going to make a little diagram of this and and we'll sort of block out some some major parts of the the body here. Um, before I do, let's go notice there's this big red part here that kind of has scraggly edges that is tucked over. This is wing that we're seeing back here. Um, here's our wing. And um, our back feathers have an upper part here with scales on it. It looks like there is a lower part here that's scruffy. I'm guessing that these back ones, these ones here are not attached to that fan that whips across the head, but yeah, that's right. Um, but you see that same pattern here. Um, here on this part of the wing down here, you see some brown feathers with stripes in them. Um, the back part of the wing here, we're seeing blue and an upper red brown part in here. So now that we've had a chance to kind of look at a few of these birds, I'm going to block out on a piece of paper what I think is going on with these rascals. So um, I am now going to There it is, stop share. Um, let's go to the piece, oops, that's not what I wanted. We're gonna go over to the piece of paper and I'm going to, to block out on a piece of paper how I would think about um, the plumage on this bird. And uh, because somebody was also um, asking about, um, kind of turning birds at different angles. Uh, we'll play with that idea in here as well. All right. So one moment. Brian, can you see my piece of paper adequately here? Yeah, we can see it. Um, so when I'm drawing a bird, um, and you'll hear me kind of explore this in, in other workshops, but I very often start with just sort of the line of the back of the bird. So the, the negative sh shape behind its back. Some birds, the whole body is at an angle like this, um, and it's flat from the head down to the back. This one, it's got a rather long neck that sticks up. And so there's a break in the angle here. So I look at the negative shape that is behind the back of that bird. And then I block in a little ball for a head and then look at the negative shape, again, the shape of the air that attaches that head sort of into the, 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 the chest. So this negative shape here is also very useful. So this bird's gonna have a little beak sticking out. The throat tucks in a little bit there. So the neck isn't doing this. It's not like here's the head and the neck comes out like this with the beak sticking out there. Hmm. So you're gonna have a head. It's gonna go back from that a little bit and the neck comes down like that. So that little piece there, important. And then that allows me to kind of block in a ball down here. So my general approach is start with that negative shape on the back, the head, the front of the throat, again, a negative shape, and then the ball of the body. Now onto this, I can start to put these different zones of feathers. Let's start with the breast feathers here. So going out from underneath the throat here and coming down and across the, the belly of the bird is going to be, that's that area that was red on, on our bird. 
These feathers are smaller up in here. And as you get further down here, these feathers get bigger. And um, also, feathers have little hooks, little barbules between the edges of the feathers. And if there are not very many hooks, the feathers themselves are so sort of feel more shaggy, more hair-like. Um, you get, you often, on, on this bird, we've got fewer barbules down here. So this part here, and especially on the edge here, is much, is much more kind of hair-like. When the bird lands and it folds its wing up, the wing usually starts off sitting on top of those breast feathers. And so you'll see the wing sticking out. But the longer it kind of goes walking around, they'll take that shoulder, this is, or the wrist actually, this is the, its wrist. They'll take the wrist here and they'll tuck it up underneath these breast feathers. And so a lot of the wing can get hidden by these breast feathers. Another thing that is going on in these pictures is um, that, that makes kind of drawing them a, a little bit confusing is um, if you look at Ray Bonto's illustration, you see these brown wing feathers right here, right? On, you look at a number of the photographs of these birds online and you don't see these feathers. And you're going like, what's up? Rebanto has drawn these, these brown feathers in here and I'm not seeing them. Um, on a bird's wing, there are two basic sections. There's a back part, if this is the bird's body, the, the part that is closely, most closely attached to the bird's body are called the secondary feathers. And then there's a fan of primary feathers that stick out to the edge, on the edge of that. So the primary feathers are coming in like this. The secondary feathers are coming in like this. These ones here, these primaries, are round. On captive birds, they will often trim off a bunch of these primary feathers. So that, or even if they want it to be a permanent job and they don't have to do it every year, they will cut off the bird's entire hand. And so the bird in captivity just has a block of secondary feathers. So this bird here, they hadn't done that to, but you'll see that sometimes done in captive birds, if you want your golden pheasant, str pheasant strutting around your estate looking majestic, um, but utterly helpless, and not going over and visiting your neighbor, um, people will sometimes trim that part of the bird. I don't recommend that. I don't think it's nice, and I don't think the golden pheasant appreciates it either. Right. So those breast feathers, um, let me see here. I am just getting um, behind the scenes here. I'm quickly scanning a bunch of photographs of, of golden pheasants to get um, more, more reference material for our discussion here. Um, so let's take a look at the, 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 the secondary feathers themselves. Um, we're going to now kind of get in our, our bird wing. We're going to put in a bird wing. Um, what I believe I'm seeing, first I'm going to do this without the breast feathers covering it up, and then I'll cover up part of it with the breast uh, feathers. Um, I think, um, actually, I'm going to do a quick search for golden pheasant wing. And if you are on a computer and it's easy for you to um, also, Um, do an, an, an image search online, you can also type in, you know, golden pheasant wing, and you will get um, there we go. 
So here is my, 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 my pheasant wing sort of folded up. Um, what you're going to see is that I'm first going to do this without color, and then we'll put color in on top of it. Without any um, color, there are going to be rows of feathers. And the bird's wrist is up in here. The primary feathers stick down. underneath the secondary feathers. The secondary feathers have several rows. There's a row of larger feathers on the bottom. And then there are rows going up onto the body of the bird. These rows, these small feathers up here are called covert feathers. And I'll put in a few of these actual feather edges. On secondaries, you usually find that there's a small feather, a medium-sized feather, and a larger feather, and then a little row of feathers all about the same length. Above those, you have another row of feathers. The next row of feathers, um, we're going to have more just sort of feathers in here. So it's sort of feathers, feathers up here. As you get higher on the wing, the feathers get smaller. Um, on your golden pheasant, color on this. Actually, first, let me kind of do something kind of cool. So this is what the, 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 the wing is going to be doing underneath there. So here's secondary feathers. Here are primary feathers that are sticking out underneath here. But the bird's breast feathers are poofing out this way over the front edge of the wing. So you often have a lot of the wing hidden by these breast feathers. And there's a little bit of wings sticking out underneath that. So a lot of the detail in here in the wrist, as this feather pheasant is going around, it is it's hiding that. And these feathers are oriented like this, right? Imagine feathers kind of coming down in here like that. But now we're going to sort of take one of these feathers here. I'm going to draw it over here on the side. One of those feathers, here's its shaft. It's got a little bit of fuzz at the top. Um, it has shafts coming out like this. And when that's getting gets sort of scraggly, you can get these gaps in these edge or these ed feather edges can bunch together. So this edge here instead of being a tight little line, can appear you'll have these sort of gaps in it where sort of in the edges of these feathers. So this can be sort of a rough edge. So I do the same thing if I'm drawing a sparrow or something. And it has a little, uh, it's got a wing that sits on its body. There's that back edge of the feathers here. You just sort of can kind of fluff up that edge that covers up the front edge of the wing. So this edge of the wing, I'm going to make it kind of fluffy. Um, on the back of the bird here, the bird's scapular feathers go in here, back feathers 
come up above that. And, or, or, or the, sometimes this is called the mantle. And then I have sort of my bird's rump down here. On the back side here, these feathers get a little bit larger towards the end. And in the bottom here, what are called my upper tail coverts in this bird, I think what I'm seeing are upper tail coverts that are really long in here. So this bird is going to have sort of a shaggy back and then longer feathers that come down. So now I'm going to take just a, 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 a pen and kind of highlight this, this, this structure a, a, a little bit more. So for the back here, um, I have sets of, let's see, I'm gonna draw in. Some lines going this way. And some lines going, so this is the, what's called the pine cone trick. So sort of two sets of overlapping lines. And in those edges, that sort of shows me <clears throat> here are these big overlapping scale. So you see how I made a sort of set of pine cone marks, two sets of overlapping lines, and I can get these big scales, actually feathers, but they're coming out in lines. So I've got a feather here, I've got a feather here, I have a feather here, this one here, it's wrapping around the edge. So rather than just draw in a bunch of scales, what I did on the back here is I, let's just sort of draw that again with, and look at what we had for those, 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 those lines. I had a set of lines going one direction, a set going the opposite direction. And where those lines meet, those are the edges of your scales. So When I do it this way, those scale rows end up lining up nicely. <clears throat> Here's the front edge of the body of the breast coming down. And I am going to just sort of suggest that this is, it's a rough edge with these little gaps between parts of feathers. Now I am On the, the back here, I don't, I'm putting in the edges of these feathers here because they had these big, bold black edges. With most feathers, I'm not going to draw in the edges of the feathers themselves. Um, and the, the reason is that it just ends up looking a little bit too much like a pine cone. With a few of them,
a little bit goes a long way. I can just suggest that there are little overlapping feathers like that. So on these few here, I'm suggesting like here are, you know, you see that and you kind of like, oh, look, there's overlapping feathers. But if I get in here and I draw in every one, this bird is going to look really, um, again, very much like a pine cone. And that's not a good look. My bird has these back feathers coming down and towards the bottom edge here. There are what I would really want to kind of get in there with it and move those feathers around to see exactly where they are. My guess is that those are upper tail coverts that are those long ones on the, the back side of this bird, but I don't know. Here's my primary sticking down. Here's the front of the belly of the bird. Now for putting in color on these, um, by a quick um, look around on the, the, the web, it appears to me that the base, the, 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 it's not one of these sort of clear cut cases where all the secondaries are one color, the covert feathers are another color. Um, what we're seeing on this bird is that the, the covert feathers, um, oh, I've still got some rather wet ink there on my page. So what I did is I put my paint down and it went Bleef! You saw that that ink just jumped out there. I don't want that. So what I'm doing is I'm just drying my brush tip off, picking up some of that, or I can even blot it like that. Okay, now I'm gonna bring in that paint again and see if I get more satisfactory result. Yeah, there you go. Now it's staying put a little bit better. Um, but what I think I'm seeing is that the, the secondaries um, here are blue. And actually, these covert feathers up in here are blue. And then I am getting into more of a, uh, a deep brown and red. So while that paint is still wet, I'm going to just take some more paint and blend these in, these edges in here. And the upper edge of those And so that gives me, I'm gonna take a little bit more paint that's a little bit thicker and heavier, just to, because on this bird I can get away with just punching in some outrageous colors. There we go. You're also letting the colors run together slightly. Does that help alleviate the coloring book effect? That's a really good point. So what I'm doing is my, my approach right here, because the paint is wet, and while it's still damp, I'm coming in and connecting up to that edge. That's giving me what's called a wet on wet effect. And what that means is that if I have some paint down. And I come past that with another color. 
and I look right there at that edge where I put this second color in, because the page is wet, this paint is going to run into that just a little bit. You notice a very crisp edge up here where it's on dry paper, but here it's just a little bit of a soft edge. So because I'm kind of coming in on paper that's already wet, these edges are running together a little bit. It gives me a little bit of a blend. So yeah, by having, you're absolutely right, by having a, um, having this be on paper that is uh, still damp, I am intentionally letting those things run together. And that's giving me that effect. Thank you for pointing that out, Brian. Um, up here on the, the back, that there's sort of that, those are the, that kind of necklace of green iridescent um, things. As I look around on, on a bunch of photographs, I'm seeing in some cases that zone um, is, I, it's, it's all bright, bright green. Um, and if I take a photograph of this bird with a flash ball, I can get an effect that's kind of like this. Oh, my brush is running out of water. Um, do I have another water brush on hand? No. Um, I'll be right back. I need to fill my water brush up. Um, I'm coming back. All right. So uh, this bird, if I to get out my flash bulb and go, I can get this green zone looking very much like that. What's happening is these iridescent feathers, the light has come, bam, it's hit them, and then uh, bounce right back to you. So you'll see this with, um, very often if people are taking photographs of hummingbirds, the iridescent feathers in the hummingbird, they will have this, you'll see all these bright colors. And that's different than what you see. You know, when you're looking at a real hummingbird, at some angles, it looks really black. And at other angles, you'll get these different colors um, bouncing back to you. Um, so if I don't want this to look like it was a photograph taken with a flash ball, I'm getting all those iridescent feathers bouncing back to you, which also can look really flat, then I am going to, um, very often there's, in the wild, there is a sort of fade of color. So while it's wet and wet, I'm bringing some blue into that edge. It's gonna help kind of give a sense of iridescence, having bright color bouncing into bright color. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go um, dark on those feathers out here. What I've got is I put some indatherone blue on the tip of my brush. And there we go. And I bring a little bit of indatherone blue, which is a very dark value blue into this edge. And now I have sort of a zone of a sheen going through it. There is sort of a fade into a blue green and then it goes into darks on the side. Um, so that 
can give you more of a sense of iridescence rather than just taking the whole thing and painting it green. Um, I can also do kind of, uh, so feathers that are blue, feathers that are green, and some purple feathers will often tend to have this sort of iridescent sheen to them. Those are what are called structural colors. Red colors and yellow colors, those are just solid pigments and they don't really change with your light angle, with the, your angle relative to the sun. If the sun is shining bright on them, they look bright. When the sun's not shining bright on them, they look darker. But it's but if as you moved your sort of viewer angle around, you wouldn't see as dramatic changes in the reds and the yellows as you would the blues and the greens. So I can actually even bring a little bit of a sense of I'll try to put a little bit of sense of some iridescence into these feathers here. I put some blue on it. Notice now the paper is dry. And so I'm then going to soften that edge with a brush with just water on it. And so there is a little bit of purple now coming in here. So just playing with a kind of a sense of, gives you more of a feeling of some iridescence going on in that part of the feathers. The back here is bright yellow and, um, or, a, or a yellow orange. And I want to get a little bit of a sense of texture in it. I also want it to be real, feel bright yellow. And so to do that, I am going to, I'm gonna to need to have, um, the, the 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 yellow on my palette be really clean. If your yellow gets muddy, you're going to have a hard time with a lot of these other colors. They can get muddy, but if but a muddy yellow um, really it, it's the it's going to show up, and so. Even though I try to keep these clean, sometimes my yellow gets a little bit gunky. I'm just, before I paint with it, I'm just cleaning out that yellow a little bit. And I'm gonna do it the same here with this Hansa yellow medium. So that's Hansa yellow light and Hansa yellow medium. I'm just gonna wet both of those and just kind of clean them off a little bit. So now when I go to paint with these, I'm not going, I'm gonna be getting some bright yellows instead of having those other gunky colors showing through. And I'm going to go light to dark here. First putting in Hansa yellow light, following that up along this edge here with some Hansa yellow medium. See how that looks very coloring booky, right? That's because it's, it feels very flat. There's just a, a wall of one color. So I'm going to now start to play with that a little bit along this edge here. Test this. I'm gonna to begin to bring in a little bit of orange. And as I do this, I'm starting the brush strokes up in the yellow and streaking them down into the orange part. And that's going to make that upper edge of the yellow just a little bit more rough. Towards the lower edge of that, I'm going to do the same with some red.
And because the paper is slightly damp, that edge softens just a bit. Now, right now, it looks a little bit like it's a sheet of plastic, right? It doesn't look like it is these sort of thin hair-like things. I'm going to play with the texture in a little bit, but first I'm going to go and play in a different area, and then I will come back to this. <clears throat> I'm going to put in a little bit of red here on the belly of my pheasant, and then um, we can come back and play with the texture here. Um, before I put the red in on the belly of the pheasant, the light is coming from back here. The belly of my pheasant is going to be a little bit more in darkness. So what I'm going to do is on my palette, um, I have a color right here. It's this purple gray. Um, that is Daniel Smith's Shadow Violet. Uh, it's a little bit of blue, a little bit of purple mixed into it. Rather dull color, but it's just got a little hint of some fun colors that sort of shine back into it. What I'll sometimes do is I will put paint in the shadow on an object at the start. Now, um, I'm imagining that this is a round belly. And so, Look at how my brush strokes are wrapping around this belly. So I imagine that you are, you're stroking the bird, you're feeling the curve of its feathers as you're painting. I'll put that shadow on first. And then this is, remember that this is this bird with this bright, um, red chest, uh, we'll be able to put in other colors directly on top of that. In order to make this um, chest feel really bright red, I want it to be this bright glowy thing. The temptation here is just to reach for my pie roll red, right, and put in red paint. I'm not going to do that. It'll look really flat. I want this just to be a little bit more glowy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some orange up in the areas of this that are going to be getting just a little bit more sunlight. And here I, again, am imagining you know, this is the, the curve of the body here. So you want to think of yourself as painting on top of something that is, is rounded. And then, test my color off to the side here. I'm going to paint on top of that. Test. There's a little bit of that shadow showing through. And I hoped that that pie roll, that, that the orange would still be wet right now when I'm kind of come to these edges because I wanted this to be a soft edge. Um, but you see how I've now got this big strip down here of orange. So what I'm going to do is with this outer edge, I'm going to clean my brush, give it a little squeeze, and I am going to just sort of paint into that edge there. Clean brush. Pull this out here. And that softens that edge. Okay, 
in a little bit more purple. And put that into the lower branches. Well, that's been going on. This part in here is drying. It's still not totally dry. <clears throat> but while it's drying, I'm going to think about taking this bird and starting just to kind of turn it around and rotate it around. As, as the bird is you know, wandering around and, and having a good pheasant day, um, I am going to be seeing these angles uh, and the, the positions of these here kind of more straight in on the side from, from slightly different angles. So if this bird were walking more towards me, not straight towards me, but let's say the middle of its chest here is kind of on a line here. Then this breast coming down, it's gonna occupy a lot of what I see. And these other parts of the body are going to just be kind of tucked in behind them. So I might have, you know, here's that, you know, here's part of the wing, might see part of the back. So the same bird, its chest walking towards me, here's the edge of this line. I want to sort of show that it is sort of rough. The wing over here, the red and the blue, I'll see that sort of sticking out. This is, you know, not very, not very much detail. Maybe just a hint of some yellow and some green back here on the neck. Um, but it's going to be mostly this. Um, this, this, this chest. And again, the center line of that chest would be coming up here. So more of this area than this area over here. Um, these legs, the bird has legs that stick out. Um, and very often you'll see the, that in this area where the breast feathers come down and the undertail coverts meet, this area up in, in here is where you're going to see the bottom of the bird's leg sticking out. And it's okay to put it sticking out here. It's okay to put it sticking out here. This is something that if I put my leg sticking out here, my bird is still anatomically correct. I could also have it here coming out here and my bird is still anatomically correct because there is a knee that's hidden up in here. There's a hip and a knee. And as that is moving around, that where the leg comes out down here can be in different places. Um, on the pheasant, you're going to see sort of looks like a, a sock coming down on the bird's thigh. And then the... Can you lift the paper up just a bit? Oh, so here's my, my leg coming down. When I have the other leg at a slightly different angle. So here's this leg. Straight line like that can make it look too much of a hard edge. I can just break that a little bit with a couple little ding -ding. The one that's further back, I'm not going to use quite a, as hard a line. So this one here gets a heavier line. Now on this bird that is walking, now think of this, this bird walking. Um, as the 
if you look at bird footprints next time you're at the beach, you'll see that the gull is walking along. Um, and you'll have one footprint here. The next footprint will be you know, here. And the next one will be this one is kind of feet turned in a little bit. But the, the feet really line up in a row. You expect it to be, you know, footprint, 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 footprint. But really what you're seeing is footprint, 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 footprint. The feet do a lot of lining up. You know, you look at the same thing, you know, looking at the tracks of an ostrich. It's not over here, over here. As it's walking along, it's taking one foot and putting it along the center line and then bringing the next foot around and putting it back on the center line. And you do exactly the same thing when you walk. You're not keeping your feet out side to side. You stand with your feet side to side. But the minute you start walking, you're bringing your feet into the center line and walking along that center line. So what we would tend to do is want to draw this bird with the feet kind of coming down like this from the front, right? You know, here's, here's one foot over here. Here's one foot over here. Right? So we're drawing that full straddle. Um, but as these guys are, are walking around, what you'll see is that these legs will cross over. So when I'm looking at it from the front, what I'm seeing here is this bird's, this leg coming down, this one coming back. And we're doing this little kind of catwalk crossover. So here, here's my bird body. Um, rather than the feet sticking down like that as it's walking along towards me, I'm seeing the bird body and this sort of a thing going on. So um, what we expect to see, um, and at first this, this looks like, like, how can you do that? How can you, how can you do that without you know, your legs getting twisted around there? No, that's just, you've got two things that are, you've got bird's legs on a center line, right? And if you're looking at it from the side, it's like that. And then you, you, you look at it and you see those two legs from a, let me uh, see if I can do that with. <clears throat> so if, if I am, you're looking at it from the, the, the side, these two legs are doing that. From the, the front, you're gonna see this crossover in the foot position. And as that bird is rocked around, where you sort of see those legs cross over can change. But that's a good thing to look, look for, kind of the bird foot crossover on the walking bird. Not on hopping birds, some birds hop, right? But on the walkers, you can look, at, like, look for this kind of very um, stylish sort of thing. Last little bit here, this is dry. I'm gonna just come by and add a little bit of texture to it. Um, I'm gonna get a little bit of some orange paint, orange brown paint. I'm gonna take my brush, fan that out, and put this a little bit of some texture in there. I liked it better before. So I'm kind of getting rid of my texture. There was a little hint of some texture in there. And also, I'm gonna fan this, see how much paint I have on my brush. Yeah, I'm gonna just bring, see if I can bring a little bit of a hint of, yeah, I like that. Uh, 
I'm going to do this with the, the brush fan like that. I can make these little lines. Just want a hint. Of some texture in there. All righty. Um, <clears throat> That is just a little bit of playing around with these colorful masses of feathers. We have a little bit of iridescent feather mixed with non-iridescent feather. Um, this, the texture in this part of the body right now still isn't uh, looking, looking right to me. Um, it feels to me a little bit like a um, get some orange in here. Something that doesn't feel quite right. I'm going to just drop some quinacridone sienna into the chest of this. Clean my brush, soften that edge. I like that better. And uh, that was fun. I hope that um, in looking at this demo, you got a, a few ideas of handling, um, uh, handling your paints and sort of playing with different parts of the body, how to splice those together. What's going on where you see um, wing, um, uh, wing disappearing underneath breast feathers? A little bit about iridescent patterns. Um, and uh, hope there are some useful strategies in there for you. Jack, before you switch away from the page, a few people were curious how you like working with a mechanical pencil with a non-photo blue, or if there's a lead that you like using. Um, I think some people either find the non-photo blue pencil doesn't show up for them, or they like carrying a mechanical pencil in general. Now this this uh, one here, my, my goal was to find a nice non-photo blue that I could, um, that I could use uh, with a mechanical mechanical pencil, um, I wanted to find one that wasn't super soft and breaking all the time. I wanted to find one that was also erasable. Um, and uh, oh, let me get the brand for you. Um, this isn't quite non-photo blue, and it is. Hold on a second. Um, it's a little bit more breakable than I would like. Um, but um, I find that when I do a demonstration on the computer that nobody can see the um, non-photo blue pencil. So that's one reason why I, I use this one. Um, here it is. Uh, and I've got two different versions of it. I've got the, this blue one, and there's also a purple version. Isn't that fun? The purple one, it's like the blue one, but it's purple. Um, so here is the purple one. This is Uni Nanodia color, U-N-I, Nanodia. And um, I just got myself a purple colored pencil and put the purple one in it and a blue colored pencil and put the blue one in it. Um, 
Let's see if I can find the container for the blue. I'm not seeing it right now, but somewhere in this in a bag of supplies. Um, the, um, and this is just a, 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 a Pentel twist erase pencil, but I filled it up with blue lead. This other one, I filled it up with purple lead. Um, I am okay with this. It's not ideal. Um, it does show up on the on the screen, um, so it's useful for online demonstrations. Um, I also find myself sometimes using this in my uh, nature journal when I am doing stuff on toned paper. This stuff shows up better on toned paper, um, and so that will work. And uh, I had a few other pencils set up like this, but, but then my daughters got into my art supplies. Was there another question? No, I think that subject, um, a couple of people would be curious to see you continue this because they like to see how you approach the patterns and the tail and some of the other areas. Um, but maybe um, another subject onto itself. Yeah. So the the, the uh, well, maybe what we can do is just well, let's just do a, a little nugget of the tail, um, because the tail has some um, really outrageous patterns in it. Um, the and. Oh, no, but I'm not gonna be able to do what I thought. I, I, I was gonna do something very clever with, um, uh, with, with masking fluid. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I, actually, I think Carolyn has got all my masking fluid right now. Um, she saw that trick and uh, she, she wanted to, she, she wanted it. Um, so I need to, to go, oh, maybe, was I smart and get, let me get a second one? Uh, hold on, just one moment. This demo may still happen. No, it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, there used to be a, um, a hard line between Ben's art supplies and all their art supplies, but now that has become a semi-permeable membrane <laughs> and, and they have, uh, they're having a, a, a lot of fun, um, uh, kind of, uh, they'll get into my desk drawer and, and try out different sorts of things in their journals. Um, the, uh, so we'll have to you know, have that be a, an, an, a, a question for another time. The, uh, I think it's fun sometimes just to have in your journal like if I just do something like this, it really feels like a study. It feels like I'm going to, you know, just going to take some part of something and mess around with it and learn something from it. But if I finish it out, like if I give it a head and a tail and the legs, um, then a lot more of the pressure to have to make a pretty picture sneaks into my head. And it starts to feel a lot less like a study. So if I'm just like, I, I want to kind of work with some of these patterns and how they kind of fit together and what's and make some sense out of that. Okay, just give myself a little thing rather than I want a complete, I want a complete picture of this whole bird. Um, doing a little bit of a, of a critter and a little piece of it here, you may find opens up possibilities um, in your journal that, you know, you, if you don't have to finish these things, you can give yourself the opportunity just to go, you know, play with something until you learn the lesson from it and then move on. So I want to encourage people to, you know, you're looking at a deer, have like a drawing of the back leg of the deer. You don't have to draw the whole deer. 
Um, the if you see see a bird um, and it's there's you can have studies of just of its beak. You can have studies of just that part of something that is catching your attention and you want to play with. And um, I think that's a good pressure relief valve for having to complete drawings from having to make your, it allows you to do studies rather than you have to now worry about the picture looking good or something.